And I think that's also important because I think subversiveness uh, is a touchstone of horror movies, but it's also a touchstone of queerness. You know, we are Absolutely. subversive people to survive and to thrive. This episode and others like it are brought to you by the generous support of my patrons over on Patreon. If you'd like early access to every video, ad-free content, and access to our Discord server, consider joining our community. Hello, and welcome to Closeted History, the podcast where we out the queer and trans history that you never knew. I am Destiny, I use she, they pronouns, and I am joined by a very, very special guest today. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Joe Valisi. I'm the editor of It Came From The Closet, Queer Reflections on Horror. So excited to be here. Thank you, Destiny. Yes, I am so excited to to finally connect and be able to have you on the show. Thanks so much for being here. We will just jump right into it. Um, you know, we were just talking about the cover. It is a beautiful book. Um, I love the design and I, I loved all the essays. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit more about the the cover design? Uh, yeah the thoughts behind that sure uh the cover is designed by the incredible braulio amado a-m-a-d-o uh he's just this incredible queer artist who's does album artwork and does uh you know tour posters and uh his work is often in like new york times magazine and just a just a random you know sort of assortment of places where his work which is so um the cover of It Came From The Closet is quite different. I feel like there's almost like a modern queer Picasso vibe to his work if you were to Google him. Uh, but I, I had seen that he had done a few book covers and I went to Feminist Press and I said, if I can have a, a dream pick, it would be Braulio. I just feel like he would do something really, really cool. And they said, well, that's a pretty in-demand artist. Um, we'll see what we can do. And Braulio was so excited about the concept of the book that he went off and designed this incredible iconic instantly iconic i think um cover it just it just sort of encapsulates the campiness and the fun of queerness and horror but also the darkness of the cover uh really speaks to the darker qualities of the essays because i think there's an incongruity where some people think that the essay collection is going to be uh something different than it is i think it's going to be like maybe sillier and campier and then they're surprised to see that the essays are all quite serious i actually like that i like that it sort of surprises people when they get into the book because there is humor and there is joy and there is uh you know um there is that sort of like communal sense of fun that horror gives us. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll talk more about that as we go on. But I think that these are serious essays about serious topics and themes um, and problems and issues that the queer community faces and uses horror either to um, elucidate or to work through or to counteract, right? So um, it's doing a lot of things at once. And so I like that the that the cover lures one in with that hand, with that limp wrist, um, and then yes, you get into. I the, love that. Yeah, <laughs> and then you get into the, and then you get into the collection, and it takes you by surprise, and it's different than you expect it to be. And I think that's also important because I think subversiveness uh, is a touchstone of horror movies, but it's also a touchstone of queerness. You know, we are Absolutely. subversive people to survive and to thrive. Absolutely, I agree. What inspired you to focus mm -hmm. on LGBTQ plus stories within horror for this collection? Yeah, um, that's a good question. The simple answer is, it is a book I always wanted to read and I kept kind of waiting for somebody to make it. And then mm -hmm. I was like, this doesn't seem like it's coming out. Uh, so I had to be a good gay Virgo and I had to do it myself. <laughs> and so I, uh, and that's sort of like the, the quick answer, but in truth, um, it is something I always wanted to read. I love the personal essay. I teach the personal essay at NYU. Um, and it's a form that I just really adore and I don't think we read enough of or there's not, you know, people read memoirs, but the personal essay is sort of, you know, the sister to what like a short story is to a novel, right? Um, mm -hmm. Where you are sort of able to focus on something specific um, and maybe do some things in terms of form that you can't do otherwise in a longer piece of work. Um, and I wanted just to know what other queer people thought about horror movies and what their relationship to it was. And I talked in the introduction a, a good deal about how I always 
just have this affinity for horror movies. Um, and because my father loved horror movies and so he raised us kids to love horror movies. Uh, but before I really had language for it, I felt that I, it was one of the few ways I could connect to my like super cis straight brothers who loved horror movies. Uh, mm -hmm. And we may have loved them for different reasons, but it was the time I felt most close to them and most secure in my relationship with them. Because again, even though I couldn't define it when I was six, seven, eight, I knew that there was a distance between us. Um, I knew that there were things that were different about me because, you know, they would make fun of me and do all the things that brothers do. Um, but not really realizing what it was they were saying or suggesting about me uh, that they knew was different. Um, uh, even if they didn't know for sure, you know, this is like the 80s and, you know, I was um, sensitive and liked to bake and read and, you know, didn't like sports, but I loved horror movies. So it felt like a real connector between me and my, my, my brothers. And then as I got older and my queerness became more pronounced within me and I was deeper in the closet with each passing year, um, I started to wonder if I was, you know, if my love of horror was actually like a, you know, like a beard of, it, of, of some kind to pretend that I was somebody that I wasn't. And I worried that horror wasn't for me. Like once I, you know, leave the closet, horror won't be available to me anymore. And it turned out to be so wrong because I, I slowly, you know, started to find other queer people on the internet, AOL chat rooms in the nineties. Um, and when I went to college, just realized, whoa, queer people, love horror movies and i became so fascinated by the fact that uh not only did we love it but we were reclaiming so much of it and that there was something about the um all of the tropes and the stereotypes that would be highly offensive to us became sort of like superpowers within the viewing of it you know i use sleepaway camp in the beginning as a prime example of that there's few movies that have such cult status and are also so transphobic and also so homoerotic at the same time that mm -hmm. it's sort of loop it's 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 mm -hmm. looped back into being part of queer culture that it belongs to us now because it's it's so extreme that it's been taken by us and now it's ours that's a lot of the story that i hear about horror that something that excludes or, vil or villainizes us um can actually be um you know uh much in the spirit of gay men in the 70s and 80s renovating the late victorian homes of san francisco queer culture goes and renovates the meaning of horror and, and we make it into something else something um perhaps more uh exciting and richer and nuanced and i also want to acknowledge that we don't know for certain but there are a lot of films where there are clues that there are queer filmmakers or queer production people working on them like somebody snuck in queerness in this film like you see it and you're like this is undeniable somebody queer is on this production right and when you get to movies in the 90s and the early aughts and they feel so much more aggro and like unquestionably masculine um or you know, patriarchal or misogynistic. Um, one has to also factor in that we lost so many queer creatives to the AIDS crisis. So how many of those people who would have been involved or been a voice in the room just weren't there for a generation. And so that must have impacted the way our movies were made for a generation, right? And now we're moving back into queer creatives entering horror and you feel the difference, you see the difference. Um, I've said a lot, but yeah, I think it's all needs to be said, yeah. Yeah, well, I, I want to go back to what you said um, about reclamation, because in mm -hmm. your introduction, you, the very, like, what a powerful opening. You say, what yeah. are you, queer or something? Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, I'm 31, so, like, I grew up in the 90s and in the early 2000s, and yeah. the early 2000s were, like, the wild west of homophobia. Um, oh, yeah, you know, oh, yeah. The, the mm -hmm. only, like representation that i had was tila tequila <laughs> um, <laughs> oh god <laughs> and she's exactly. nobody representation but so you know um we really had this lack of representation um growing up and so i i love that not only are we reclaiming horror in these very specific ways but also that we're creating kind of representation for ourselves because mm -hmm. now now yeah. we are the queer elders 
Um, <laughs> you, you brought up that, you know, unfortunately, we did lose so many people to the AIDS crisis, right. and you you wonder what could have been. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's it's really just such a, a privilege and an honor to create that representation. And so I'm Absolutely. I'm I'm so glad that you did so with your your wonderful book. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, so what do you think draws people or queer people specifically? Why do you think that queer people are so drawn to horror? It's a good question, and I think it's one with uh, not only one answer, right? I think it's different for every queer person and their connection, and that's one of the things that I wanted the book to do. I wanted the book to sort of give um, such varying perspectives and points of entry into what queerness and horror, like the ways that they connect with and inform or complicate the life of a queer person or their experience. Um, so I can't speak for all but i think that my general sort of like thesis if i could uh articulate it into something simple would be that i think there is that goes back to that word subversiveness that sort of hiding in plain sight quality that most of us you know most of us have some would say that they could never hide their queerness and that it was always you know prominent but uh I, I would say the vast majority of those who ever identified as being in the closet would say that um you are sort of just lurking you know part of you is lurking and being treated as villainous um in your own story and you have to conceal yourself but at the same time we also have to be the hero we have to be the final girl or boy in our story too because we have to um you know fight off that perception of others that we are somehow sinister or evil or wrong um and so i think that the relationship is really complicated but i think it's also um because of the, those subversive subtexts that exist in so many horror movies, so, so many mm -hmm. of them. Somebody once said to me, a good friend of mine said, queerness is a superpower because we read things into the world, into situations, into our lives, into art that others don't have access to. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's really, really true of horror movies and your queer perspective versus sort of a cishet perspective, um, they're just different and that, that's okay. Like, you know, there was a time I was like, no, 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 we're all the same. We're just like you. We have to, and we're kind of rejecting that now. Like, no, let's, let's announce the difference between the queer community and the community that does not think of themselves as queer um, because we want to embrace and use that difference. Um, and I think that there's something about the way we watch and look for clues that just makes the connections just start to form. I mean, there are some people in this collection who um, I think have really hard relationships to the movies that they chose. Um, they're not pleasant. Um, mm -hmm. Or the experience that they're connecting it to is really, you know, unpleasant. My my own essay is like that. Um, there are many essays where the, the experience tied to it is a difficult one, it's a traumatizing one. Um, and then the horror movie creates either some levity or solace or um, some focus, some ability to heal through focusing on something uh, within the film. Um, but I think that it's, you know, it's, there's not one answer, but I think it's all of a piece that we are all reading ourselves into the films and then getting some empowerment uh, from, like, I have an ability to see into this film text, something that somebody else wouldn't. Like I think about my brother and I, we used to watch The Sopranos together. We're, you know, Italians from New Jersey. We love The Sopranos. And mm -hmm. um, I would talk about like how literary, like something was in that episode, how like crazy. And, and my brother would be like, uh, no, this is just like a mob show. Like he just, I don't see that at all. And it was, and it's true because you can watch it as a lover of, you know, Goodfellas, mob movies. Um, but Sopranos is so rich. Sopranos is a novel, many novels. It is a, it is an exquisite show. Um, for anybody who hasn't, who hasn't watched The Sopranos, you must, you must. It's just, it, it's so, it is literary. It is literary and funny and dark and it's, really amazing but my brother didn't watch it for that didn't watch it like that and i was very much you know looking for not queerness in the sopranos though there's certainly elements of it but i was always reading for and sympathizing with the women in the show and you know like and he you know was like oh that's unrealistic there'll never be a female mob boss or oh you know he would have snapped her neck for you know speaking to him like that like this very like macho thing that 
creates a very narrow lens, right? Um, mm -hmm. My brother is not a narrow-minded person. He's very supportive of me. He's a wonderful brother. We have a great relationship, but it's funny to see like the way I'm looking at something versus the way he's looking at something. And I think that those queer eyes um, are, are just really, it's the queer gaze, right? Like, you know, fuck the male gaze. It's the queer gaze that is something we apply to horror and for, and i also want to say one last thing about this is that i think because horror movies were sort of relegated to sort of like trash and nobody took them seriously for so long there was such mm -hmm. a pile of stuff with like just just so many movies to go into and to play around in and discover something that you that you loved or connected with um i don't think many other film genre can offer that to people. There are so many bad horror movies that have some moment of perfection or some moment that feels queer, even if it's not queer in a sexual sense, just it's just it's queer. And, you know, feeling uh, a connection to that um, and having so much to pull from, I think has just been really exciting for queer people. So now there, there are decidedly queer stories being told, which is wonderful. Um, mm -hmm. But I think like anything, when it goes a little bit more mainstream, the queer community, uh, you know, romanticizes and has nostalgia for the times when we were searching for it, as opposed to it being brought to us, right? Like we want both and we should have both. But I think there's a certain joy in seeking out those subtexts, right? Yeah. It, exactly. Pulling out that subtext is like, you know, my favorite part, analyzing uh, whether it's a show like The Sopranos or yeah. or a text or a movie. I, I like that you said the the queer gaze. How did you select um like the essays? How what was your process in kind of um selecting what would be a part of the collection? Yeah, so I had a very simple prompt in the call for papers uh that just it was a personal essay focused on one particular film. It basically had to have some sort of connection between your queer experience and the film. And I left it really, really open. Mm -hmm. um, and it, so from idea to publication, it was five years. Oh, um, wow. A lot of, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I had to present to publishers possibilities and I had to slowly wait until I got sample essays that I would want to publish that would show variety and would show like the thrust of what I want this book to be and that took some time the the very first essay that I uh you know snagged was Richard Scott Larson's Long Nights in the Dark um about Michael Myers and mm -hmm. Mike Myers as uh Halloween is a coming out story in his own um, you know, experience and um, which Richard developed into a full memoir that came out a few months ago called The Long, oh. the Long Hallway. Okay. Um, and it's incredible. It it's out. incredible. Oh, yes. I must recommend to everybody The Long Hallway by Richard Scott Larson. It's beautiful. It is um, an expansion of that essay. And he'd, he'd previously published it. So the first piece that I took was going to be a republication. There's only a few in the collection of 25 essays. I think only four were previously published. And that was important to me and the publisher as well to have as much new material as possible. Um, mm -hmm. So I had that as sort of like a, like a wonderful, perfect template for the kind of essay that I wanted, though it didn't need to be exactly like that. I didn't want 25 coming out stories. I didn't want, you know, like the structure to all be the same, but I wanted something like that. And slowly I started to get good, strong work that I knew I wanted in there. And so when I had, about nine, and I had a strong proposal to go to publishers with. Um, then the sort of uh, search for more work started fresh. Once Feminist Press, um, which I was so excited about because they were my dream publisher, and I didn't hear back from them. And I have a good friend, Carly Moore, who has several novels published on the Feminist Press. And she was like, I know you're not supposed to, but just send it again and let them know that you never heard back. She goes, I really think that they would want this. And so I did it. I did the thing you're not supposed to do. And I immediately heard back from somebody like, oh my God, I don't know how we missed this in the slush pile. Thank you. And we had a meeting a week later and a contract a week after that. And so it was just great. Um, and they helped me to sort of narrow contributors to look for, people to solicit, but also um, gave me space and time to keep going back to Twitter and going back to Instagram and going and resubmitting, you know, the call for papers, you know, at Lambda Literary. And so it, it just took quite a while. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I got 240 essays and I wound up 
publishing wow. 25. So there was a lot, um, and it's difficult to say no to essays that are good, but don't quite fit. Um, also, I think a lot of people misunderstand what essays are, so that's kind of tricky. So some things were not essays, they were just reviews, or they were sort of a patchwork of queer experience and, you know, uh, sort of thin connection to movies. Um, but basically, my selection process was like, I'll know it when I see it, I'll know it when I feel it, um, that this is the type of piece that I want in there, which is not fair, but I'm a fair editor. So even if it doesn't feel clear to others, I know that I'm being equitable. I know I'm being really you know, judicious and careful about what I put in the book. Um, I want as much diversity as I could you know, possibly have, but I didn't want diversity just for diversity's sake. I wanted to make sure it was a diversity of not only the writer, but of the idea, of the theme, of the approach. Um, and I'm very, very fortunate that I got that in the end, and I was always looking for it, but I never wanted it to feel, you know, pandering. I wanted it to be a real, you know, and you can never get as much of everything as you want in an anthology. Uh, mm -hmm. They originally contracted me for 12 essays, and I was like, hey, FYI, I think it's going to have to be 25. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, but there was no way, there was no way to do it with a dozen. It had to be like this. Um, and if I could have made it 50, I probably would have found a way. Um, so selection process was just gut. And also it was, uh, there were plenty of pieces that I knew weren't there yet, but I felt could get there. And the teacher in me worked with writers for many, many months to get their essays where it needed to be many revisions and they were all so excited about the project that nobody said, no, I'm not working on this anymore. Everybody who did any work on it, their their essay, and most everybody got notes for some things to do, but some came sort of fully formed and there were mm -hmm. some that don't even resemble the essay. She won't mind me saying my dear friend through the collection, Addie Sai, um, wrote the essay about dead ringers and being a twin, twin skin, uh, mm -hmm. and her, her initial essay to me was like a 22 page essay on black swan mm. and the essay that is the finished product is a like seven page essay on dead ringers <laughs> like completely everything about it changed through our collaboration um and it's it's the essay it was meant to be and she was so open to um working with me on it and that close connection turned us into like the best of friends um and so i love that so there were a lot of experiences like that where i worked really really closely with the writer to excavate something that was just a hint of something and then they wrote something totally new as a result um that happened with prince shakur's essay there was a seed of something that i found and uh they just kept revising 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 and then finally it was like wait a second i think there's pieces from each of these revisions that I that I think we can put together and make a whole new essay out of. And that's the essay that wound up in it. So there was a lot of just wonderful collaboration. Um, but I wanted to not feel like if something wasn't completely there yet, that it was a no for me. It was rather something, there's something brewing here. Um, and I definitely chose essays like that to build up over fully formed essays that were quite good but just didn't feel like they were doing anything new or were just going to be redundant and i wanted to stay away from redundancy um and that was sort of one of the you know few rules that i had i just didn't want anything to feel repeated and i didn't want to have you know very careful to not have you know like cis gay men too overrepresented because that was sort of the initial, you know, that was who I could sort of find in the beginning. And so I was like, okay, now I have to like pivot and really work hard to, you know, um, find other writers who will, you know, um, do something wonderful. And I solicited a few, I can't say their names, big writers who responded, who were so kind, but were like either I don't like horror movies or I don't want to go there and think about horror because being queer, being trans is enough of a horror movie. And I have to respect that and say, that is a perspective that I have to respect and it's sobering to hear. And I want to keep that in mind when structuring this book so it doesn't alienate somebody who feels that way about mm -hmm. the horror genre, right? So that was also very, so those no's to me were very instructive 
for how I structured the book and thought about it as a collection. Are there any essays within the collection that you feel like stand out for like their unique take on yeah. LGBTQ plus themes in horror? I, I personally really loved the one about Jaws. Um, yeah, it's a great one. I have seen that movie so many times. Uh, it, <laughs> you know, it's an older movie. And like I said, you know, I grew up in the 90s and 2000s. And so mm -hmm. um, that was very emblematic of my mother's childhood. Um, and so she had seen the movie hundreds of times. You know, it was kind of <laughs> like a, a repeat comfort movie for yeah. her. Um, in, in the same way that it was for the author of the essay. And so I, I really loved um, he, kind of hearing that personal connection. Um, yeah. and, and I loved the read, like, you know, it, it's kind of yep. like you were saying before that it's, it's that queer lens that, you know, once you put it on, you're like, Oh, okay. Um, yeah. so were there any, any, uh, essays within the collection that like really stood out to you? Yeah. Well, thank you for, of course, all of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, yeah, they're all, they're all my children and I, you know, you don't want to choose, but I, but I think your question is specific in a way that I do have answers for you. Um, I think absolutely three men on a boat by Jen Corrigan, the jaws essay. I think that that is such a fascinating lens. I really think that, uh, Tasha Taylor's Wolfman's daughter subtly does that work too. Um, you know, this sort of like subtle, but there in the background Appalachian, uh, environment and sort of mm -hmm. that's a very specific culture and so for mm -hmm. her to like connect this like classic movie to a very um, homophobic religious zealot father um, and their own burgeoning uh, homosexuality I think it was just super fascinating and um, offers a read because it's a story ultimately about a father and a son and she is telling it as a father daughter story. So even mm -hmm. something small like that, I adore Carol Narby's indescribable. Uh, they write about the blob and society. Um, <clears throat> and you know, for those who have not read the book, um, but hopefully will after hearing this, uh, the, the sort of simple pitch of that essay is that, Caro winds up in the hospital very ill, um, like near death at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, and uh, they're agender, and they begin to see themselves much because of the way they're being sort of treated or regarded by the medical professionals around them as a thing, as a blob instead mm -hmm. of as a person, because they sort of live between or transcend gender they um you know were finding that every with each passing day it seemed like somebody recognized them less and less from you know the the norm of what um gender is supposed to be and, and it's it's written with great humor it's also great academic pieces to it like carol's just a brilliant brilliant human um and so it, it, they come at it from so many directions. Um, it's just kind of a just gorgeous whirlwind of a piece. So it's it's funny, it's serious, it's um, very much doing very close queer readings of those films, but mm -hmm. also uh, thinking about themselves as monstrous through the eyes of others. And I, I just think that it's a really special piece. Um, I adore Tucker Lieberman's The Trail of His Flames. Um, which is this very interesting approach to writing about Nightmare on Elm Street. Tucker essentially um, deals with trauma, uh, both the loss of a dear friend and also the trauma of embracing or struggling to embrace their transness with A Nightmare on Elm Street and essentially retells the story of A Nightmare on Elm Street by inserting themselves into the narrative. So the essay is like, they take on the role of Nancy, but Nancy as them. Um, mm -hmm. And it's, it, it's really, really fascinating. Um, I just adore that one. Uh, there's so many, let me give you one or two more because I'm looking through. I love uh, Notes on Sleepaway Camp, Viet Dinh's essay that closes the collection, which is a play on Susan Sontag's Note on Camp. Um, mm -hmm. And so Viet uses the structure um, of the Sontag essay, but instead of camp it's sleepaway camp it's got its serious notes but it, it's a 
by reimagining notes on camp as sleepaway camp it is enacting camp in the truest sense of a very misunderstood and misused term so i mm -hmm. really love the way they do that um and let me give you one more like i love them all so much as you can tell I'm, uh, and i've spent so much time with them that i'm so i'm so versed and i can make an argument for for any of them um two more i'll say that zephyr lazowski's the girl the well the ring which is both the ring and pet cemetery and thinks both about transness and disability as monstrosity in those films mm -hmm. uh thinking about how zelda in pet cemetery was played by a man so that you know sort of does this weird uncanny thing of like what are we looking at like this is you know this this poor sick young girl is so monstrous that she's masculine right um mm -hmm. and then in the ring you know samara is abused and she's basically forcibly disabled um mm -hmm. and uh and it's like is is the is the declaration that she's evil the thing that disables her or is the disability the thing that makes her evil and zephyr really explores and examines that in just the most incredible way and the last one i'll mention is the first essay in the book a demon's a demon girl's guide to life about the exorcist mm -hmm. um as trimble who goes by t just does this amazing thing about thinking about putting queerness onto father Karras in the exorcist which i always felt some of that and to have it articulated so clearly and so um specifically is really wonderful but also the idea of wagen being in drag like demon mm -hmm. drag mm -hmm. and that yeah. right because there is this like masculine energy that is invading her body um but also t does this wonderful thing of thinking about their upbringing in the church and how they you know would participate in jesus drag like it's it's, it's just it's so it's funny but it's 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 real and it's serious and it's political and it's um just a wonderful way to start the collection i could go on i could talk about every single essay because i think they all do exactly what you ask mm -hmm. Uh, but the, that's a handful. Yeah. Yeah. I really liked the, the exorcist one. Um, cause you know, as I mentioned to you before, I'm in North Carolina and so yeah. you know, born and raised in the South sure. that religion is a really big part of, um, life here for a lot of people. Ah. And so kind of unpacking and to see that unpacking of religious trauma in the way that it intertwines with queerness and mm -hmm. with transness i really really liked that one and so did you notice any like reoccurring themes or symbols in the essay that fit well with mm -hmm. lgbtq plus horror and how did you choose which ones to highlight i uh, gave myself the like the freedom or, or i took the stress off myself to be searching for thematic consistency and because i knew that organically i sometimes will refer to this as a collective queer memoir because I, I sort of knew that we would get to just naturally, organically, we'd get to so many places together. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, so I didn't stress myself out or burden myself too much with that. But as I started to pull the text together, um, our relationships to our bodies became something so prominent in this. Our mm -hmm. bodies as, as sexual, our bodies as monstrous, our bodies as weak or strong. Um, the body, the queer body is an endangered body. It is one that endures harm um, in the hands of somebody who, um, you know, others us, right? There's always the possibility for violence, for harm. Um, and there's that. There's also the body as um, another theme that's connected to the body, but also outside of it. Um, there are a few pieces, including mine, about queer parenthood. Um, mm -hmm. So there's Will Stockton's Child's, uh, Child's Play essay. There's mine on the movie Grace and Jude Doyle's amazing piece about um, trans mask pregnancy uh, using... Uh, one of the new French extremity horror movies in my skin that I just love so much, The Healed Body, it was called. Um, and I I saw parenthood or gestures towards parenthood. Also, uh, there's an essay by um, Sarah Fonseca's Bad Ombre, the Cuban horror movie that she links to her own violent father or violent homophobic father. So there's the there's parenthood in that way. There's the there's the, you know, um, that her father is not queer, but 
about the rejection of queerness by the parents. So I saw that sort of emerging too. Um, and I also saw how class and um, race and religion were all sort of creeping up into the essays as well. Um, not always prominently, but almost every essay has some measure of that. We're thinking about class, we're thinking about privilege, we're thinking about um, religion, we're thinking about location, we're thinking about geography, we're thinking about where where in the world you are, um, where you're writing this. Um, so yeah, so those all sort of came out as I started to compile it. And I knew that it would, I knew they would start to um, emerge because I think it's like, you know, eventually they're all side by side and you start to see things meld and blur into each other and text is always in conversation with other text even if it's not intended to be so uh that was very much true here um yeah i i, I feel fortunate that it's so rich thematically i think the only thing that i was careful of was that redundancy of story and i think by making sure there was not much redundancy of story or of experience um it lent itself to this beautiful buffet that developed um, in the book. I love, and I keep coming back to just the title, It Came From the Closet, Queer Reflections yeah. on Horror. You know, I think that when people initially think about horror, um, it might not cross their mind that it is a very queer genre. Mm -hmm. um, but just that name, the the name that you chose for the collection, I think that it really represents that very well um, because there is that demonization of queerness and the the same kind of demonization that we see of, you know, monsters and and um, supernatural things of not this world that coming from from the closet. And um, you mentioned that othering. I think that that is why um, LGBTQ plus folks are so drawn to horror because um, in our in our lives, often we we can be othered and we kind of see ourselves within Absolutely. the horror genre in, in that regard. What impact do you hope um, It Came From the Closet will have on discussions about LGBTQ plus representation in horror? Yeah, I'm so grateful that it is um, starting lots of conversations. Um, you know, October, only two years since it came out, which is wild to me. Um, but I already see it in the messages that I get. I see it in, you know, uh, there is a uh, Lamando, which was, um, which is a, art space in Baltimore last mm -hmm. year. I found out just with like a Google, a Google alert. I was like, what is going on here? They built an entire film and discussion series based off the book. So for many, many months, a different movie was screened and people would come and they would talk about the themes and they would read the essay connected to it. I was like, this is just happening on its own somewhere in Baltimore. So I wrote them and I was like, I want to come. And so I actually went to the first one. They did a screening of Jennifer's Body um, and I came and talked about the book and the intro and the um, it was it was amazing. I was like, this is incredible. I can't believe that I'm, you know, here in this random City where you know this is happening on its own, right? Mm -hmm. They 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 didn't get in touch with me. I found them and I was like, hey, I want to come. This sounds cool, you know. Um, and so things like that are amazing. When I when I get uh, at least once a week, somebody will send me a photo. Somebody I don't know will send me a photo on Instagram of the book on display somewhere in America or internationally at this point, and it makes me so happy. And I and I say, may I? repost this and say where it is and be like, yes, please. Um, I will get notifications that it's been added to libraries across America and that, you know, given all the bullshit that's happening um, with the conservative right and libraries and teachers uh, does not make, I, I could not be happier to know that it is suddenly in public libraries or in school libraries um, and that it's being highlighted and that people who work at those libraries are writing little summaries on the website about the book and why they think it's a great pick. Um, so it's just having these little, um, you know, being invited on a wonderful podcast like this, that, that happens to me every few months. And, you know, still, there was a lot of it last year, but it's still happening. I'm still getting to talk about this and talk about horror. So I know that it's 
you know, moving through the world. You know, we've we've sold uh, twenty five thousand copies of it. It's a lot. Wow. Yeah, um, I don't usually share the figure, but I think it's worth saying that it's 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 you know, in every Pride Month, every Halloween, the sales go up, and you know, more people are interested in it, and it, it's it's um. There's an amazing audiobook version of it as well that I hear from people when they discover the audiobook, which is um, the audiobook is uh, multi narrator. So each essay mm -hmm. has a different voice, and everybody is queer or trans who read. So it's like the audiobook itself is in conversation with and living the promise of the book, right? And that makes me really happy. So um, anything from a, from a message from somebody saying that they loved something or, you know, um, sending a, you know, sending a picture. Um, I just know that it's in the, you know, I'll get like an alert that somebody has used it in like an academic paper in graduate school. It's been noted or put on the reading list or I've been cited in my intro and I'm like, ah, this is great. You know, like that's what I want. I, I want, you know, it to just be continuing to develop and latch on to things and find its way into spaces. And, you know, I'm going to the Brooklyn Book Festival in uh, two weeks. Because I've been asked to go sign copies of it, and yes, of course, I've been you know, you know, uh, the Independent Bookstore Day in the spring in New York. You know, I was asked if I would come to a bookshop and go and sign copies of it. So it's um, it's just still got a life, and I was hoping for that. I was hoping that when you do an anthology, it can be sort of perennial and evergreen, and uh, it can have this same sort of impact you know, in two more years, four more years, five more years, because it is the first of its kind. And I want it to not be the only of its kind. I want others to, you know, pick up the gauntlet and find niches within horror or queerness or whatever, and create their own anthologies as a result. Um, if somebody came to me with an offer to do a sequel, I would, but I uh, know there's so much left to be said. And I, but I'm also would just be really happy if um, others go forward and uh honor the conversation of horror and queerness in their own way um so you know yeah i feel i'll take the credit to a small degree that i helped to um create a dialogue in a certain way in a certain genre in a certain medium but it also was just the right time for the book because this was happening in culture anyway um mm -hmm. and my, my students here like you know um they hear they hear horror they get really excited now they hear queerness and horror and they're like whoa and so it, it, it's um it's there this generation wants it you know and is receiving it and so i think we're only going to go forward and go up from there yeah i will say that like you know what i've seen the book has been very well received um yeah. and that like you know on book talk or like books bookstagram um many <laughs> people are looking for things just like it um, that yeah. it is kind of the the first of its kind. And, and I love that it's about us, it's by us, and it's mm -hmm. for us. Um, yeah. So, oh, you know, I, I just love to see that. Um, well, so were there any voices or themes that you wanted to include but couldn't? Or, you know, maybe there was something like an essay you said that you got like over 250. Maybe there was an essay that you liked. Um, but you didn't feel like it fit into the collection. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, no, there were totally essays that I would have, would have loved to have included, but they just didn't get there. Um, they just didn't, the writer either didn't want to or couldn't um, do the work to um, make it what it needed to be. Um, I think in terms of like themes, I feel so something that's exciting is that gender and our, our understanding of it and the sort of complicated nature of it um, is evolving all the time. So I think that like, if I were like doing like a annual update to the book, right? I might wanna keep looking for essays that tackle gender and its evolution and it's sort of a, the way in which it's such a hot button and, and people are so, you know, losing their minds over the idea that there could be more than two genders or that gender doesn't exist at all. Like it's just such a affront to a certain type of 
thinker, right? Um, so more essays on gender, whatever that means, uh, certainly more trans and non-gender conforming um, and non-binary writers would be something that I would certainly um, want more of. So it's less about things I couldn't get in, but more about things that I that I know are not as full as they could be just because of the limitations of making a book in a time and you know only being able to work with what you have. Um, mm -hmm. I think certainly culturally, um, eth you know, culturally, ethnically, racially, um, I would love it to be even more expansive. And that's something that, um, you know, is always going to be a failing, you never quite be as inclusive as you want to be. Um, and I tried my best, but I know that uh, it is definitely, there's a deficit there, um, regardless, right? Like, there will never be a perfect version of that. So I think just getting more voices and increasing inclusivity and diversity in all those ways um, is something that I that I really wanted. And I'll and I also you know there are things that are not in here like there's no Nightmare on Elm Street Part Two, Freddy's Revenge, mm. which is the gay Freddy movie, right? And I got a <laughs> bunch of essays on it, but I was like. I think this has been talked about enough. There's a great documentary called Screen Queen about the actor who was in the movie. There's a, and like, it's sort of, it's maybe the most like well-known queer, you know, mainstream or queer baby horror story or whatever you want to say about it. Um, mm -hmm. So it didn't feel necessary to include it. I got good essays on it. I got a lot of essays on it. And it just didn't feel like it was necessary. I wanted like Tucker Lieberman's crazy, wild, new take on the original name on Elm Street. That's what I wanted, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I uh, think that some things were not there because I also just was cognizant that there'd been enough discussion about them. Um, it didn't mean that somebody couldn't give me something that was a brand new take or mm -hmm. uh, innovative, um, and I would know put that in there um but it just didn't quite work out that way um but i don't know is there anything that you think the book doesn't have is there something that you were hoping to find an essay on that would be very very informative for me if there was something that you you know were like oh i wish there was like one more essay about this thing like, i'm curious what that would be i really liked the one on pet cemetery i think that if you were to do a part two i think maybe more examples and connections to more modern um, horror films because mm. I think there was a lot of representation of the like the 80s kind of slasher but also that it, it kind of speaks to to our I guess collective in terms of movies that the 80s were very popular for horror films um, and yeah, that very formative Horror films as uh, like horror as a genre has definitely changed quite a bit over the last, mm -hmm. you know, four decades. Yeah. Um, and so I think it would be interesting maybe as a perspective to offer like kind of that progression of like, okay, mm -hmm. this is how we saw queerness and transness, gender, you know, all of the things in this collection of horror films, but this is how it's progressed through time and how we can still kind of pull those things out. Um, I think it would be yeah. interesting to have um, some more modern examples of, of queer queerness in horror. I wonder if you should edit that book of essays. That sounds very <laughs> focused and very clear. Yeah. Oh, and I, wow. think what's smart of, well, I think what's smart about that too, that's a very smart observation. I think that um, now that there is more like overt queerness, in horror and horror mm -hmm. being made by queer people, how does that impact the way the viewer is thinking about their own queerness and relationship to it, right? Because these other movies, for the most part, we must read ourselves into that story. We must uh, find and take the queerness from it. Uh, so what happens if you are writing about a movie that is directly queer, right? Like how does that change mm -hmm. The approach, right? How does that change the lens through which we think about it? I think that's a very smart observation and something I'll think about. Well, so what advice would you offer to to writers or editors who want to explore LGBTQ plus themes within horror? Well, definitely buy it came from the closet and buy lots of copies of it and give it to friends and all that. I I think that 
there is so the funny thing about me is I love horror movies and I'm a writer and I put this book together, but I'm not a big reader of horror genre novels or anything like that. And I, and I know, and that's my own um, blind spot, but I know that queerness in horror is rich and happening in genre novels, uh, horror, thriller. Um, and so I think that one can find that readily these days because, you know, despite the type of um, censorship that I think we're fighting against and going to have to fight against for a while, I think books remain a space where lines can be crossed and um, there can be, you know, um, we can still shock and we can still probe and uh, dig deep beneath the bone to be a little gross and horror-ish. Um, we can find a lot of that in literature. So, mm -hmm. um, and I want to do more of it myself. I'm, I'm no expert in it, but um, I think that, um, yeah, I think that's where that's where you look for it. I also think that one can challenge themselves by reading things that are not explicitly queer, but look for the queerness within them, right? And I think that um, it, it's a good practice. It's a good practice to look for it. I think you're not going to find it everywhere, um, but it certainly is a legitimate approach to reading a text. Um, and it's less about trying to project or insist on queerness in something and say that exists, even if there's no evidence for it, but rather do you as a queer reader find some sort of you know, like inherent connection to this and why, right? Why do you feel like there is um, something that speaks to you in this text, right? That um, is awakening or rattling some part of your queer identity, even if it's not explicitly queer. So I think that I also would hope that it came from the closet uh, gives people permission to look for that in film, in other pieces of literature, other works of art, right? Because the book is also a little bit instructive without being didactic, like saying, look, you can find, right? And it doesn't ruin the movie, it doesn't change it, it doesn't bastardize anything, it doesn't spoil, uh, spoils plot points, but it doesn't like spoil, the movie still exists as is, but here's an alternative viewing of it, here's an alternative reading of it. And I think that that can be applied to text of any kind. That's my feeling. Yeah. Well, our last question, uh, what has yeah. been the most surprising or rewarding part of working on It Came From the Closet? Well, I touched on it a bit before, how I developed really wonderful friendships with writers in the book and also my editor of Feminist Press, Nick Whitney, he and I are very, very close. And um, I guess I didn't expect that the sense of community would that I write about <clears throat> um, in the intro and also hoped for in the book's creation um, would actually manifest in such a way that it really feels like the claim that I make about horror being this wonderful, collaborative, communal experience um, is now jumping out of the pages. And, you know, the messages that I get from people, um, the podcasts that I go on, um, you know, the conversations with readers um, that I just get through email, you know, the been a few difficult messages from people who aren't happy with some things about the book and that comes with the territory um but for the most part it's just been such an overwhelmingly positive response i remember being really genuinely worried when first critical reviews were coming out that it was going to get panned or ignored and the opposite happened you know the first the first few uh, major like trade reviews, you know, uh, came out and they were, you know, starred reviews and said just the most beautiful things about it. And um, I, uh, I just really, not that it should matter, right? But it was less about whether or not they liked it and more about whether or not they understood the mission and the purpose of the book. And when I started to see how oh, good people get it, the, you know, people reading it, critics, they get it. They understand what we're doing. Um, they understand what I wanted to achieve. And that was the most surprising and gratifying. So between the sort of community that has developed from it, the fact that the book continues to reach people, um, the fact that they still get invited onto this wonderful podcast such as yourself, that has been this sort of um, continued joy and surprise of the project, but also just that people got it. And there were 
publishers who didn't get it. There was one that I almost worked with who uh, it became really, really clear just in the last minute that they didn't understand what I was doing and they were going to try to change it into something quite different. And um, I was so, it was um, difficult to say, I think we can't work together on this when I had no other publisher. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, but then Feminist Press reemerged and um, got it entirely and gave me complete freedom to do it as I wanted to do it. And I was like, this is amazing that they see this vision and they see the necessity of this book in the world. Um, and that was very validating. And, and also um, another surprise that I must mention, because you're talking about Jennifer's body, is that Carmen Ria Machado uh, said yes to being in the book. That was a big, big coup. And I was so grateful to her. And she wrote just, you know, a banger of a piece about Jennifer's body. And, you know, she would say that the, the joy was all hers because she um, has been wanting to write about that movie forever. And she finally had the opportunity to do it. And I and it's one of the essays that people comment on most frequently, um, as they should, because uh, that movie has such a reappraisal and Carvin's approach to the sort of queer baby uh, accusations of the film is really spot on. And also, it's a simple thing, but when somebody of that caliber, of that fame, uh, who's so celebrated, puts themselves in a little book that could like this, they are signaling to other readers and to the culture that this is a book worth picking up because it, um, you know, my work fits here at home with these lesser known writers and, um, and I think that that's a real gift. And so uh, that was a wonderful surprise to her willingness to write something totally original for it. And she participated in a lot of promotion for it um, in the beginning, which was really, really lovely. And so um, I'm grateful that we had that sort of like, that match was struck really, really strongly in the beginning. So I'm grateful to Carmen for that. Um, and I'm also really grateful to Bishak Som, who did all the interior illustrations. Um, that was an added layer of, I couldn't believe that. I was like, oh my God, we're gonna get like illustrations in this book too? That's, mm -hmm. uh, wow, this is this is becoming a total feast for the eyes and, and the mind. And um, so I'm, I'm so grateful for that. So just, yeah, it's just, my gratitude is not a surprise to me, but I'm, Oh, but I'm still surprised and touched and overwhelmed by the things I have to be grateful for as a result of the collection. So the the hard work, the very hard, very solitary work that I was doing for much of it um, was not in vain. It was the opposite, whatever the opposite of in vain is for. It's just been a joy. And um, I'm very, very thankful that it came together. And I'm thankful that people continue to find it and continue to love it and continue to want to talk about it. Well, I'm I'm so, so grateful that you put together this collection. It's a really, really wonderful collection um, to you. all the listeners out there who haven't read it yet. Um, again, it came from the closet, Queer Reflections on Horror, with this beautiful, beautiful cover that is so well designed. And all of the, the pictures, as you mentioned, also kind of yeah. add that layer to it. Um, well, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, do you want to tell people where they can find out more about you and more about the book. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so it came from the closet. You can purchase it on feministpress.org or any independent bookshop. It is available on the evil Amazon uh, if you must, but please don't go to bookshop, go to any, I mean, it, the book is really everywhere. I'm also genuinely surprised and grateful that it can be found pretty much anywhere. Um, that always just warms my heart. Um, and if you are in the UK or Ireland or Europe, there is a new edition of the book that came out last June on Saraband Books in the UK. It features an introduction by Kirsty Logan, who is a wonderfully witchy writer, sort of like um, in some ways the Carmen Machado of uh, Scotland. Um, and she has her own essay in the book too. So it's an expanded version of it, um, which is exciting. So if you're a completist, you can also find that. You can find the audio book on Blackstone Publishing um, in the traditional CD. And they also, um, I believe it's available on Spotify if you have that to also listen on there. Um, and you can find me on uh, Twitter slash X at homo horror, H-O-M-O. H O R R O R. Um, but I'm more frequently on Instagram. Uh, it came from the closet and it's just um, an underscore between each word because somebody else had the other version. So it underscore came underscore from the closet. 
you can find me there. Um, so between those two, I like to update um, everybody on, you know, things connected to the book. They're still out in the world. And uh, yeah, and I'm hoping to have a new anthology project um, settled that I can't quite chat about yet, but I'm fingers crossed. Um, I think there'll be another queer centric, not on horror movies, but still queer writers um, that I'm currently uh, trying to find a publisher for. So fingers crossed for that. You'll hear more from me in the near future. We're looking forward to your next anthology and thanks again so yeah. much for being on the show. Um, and Thank you. we'll catch you the next time. 